Welcome to the Let's Eat Grandma Let's Eat Career Grandma. Warrior Podcast. And welcome to the Let's Eat Grandma Career Warrior Podcast, where our goal is not only to help you land your dream job, but to help you live your best life. Today, we're going to talk about crafting the best resume you can for your job search. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, there is so much to know about resumes, so many myths, and so many things that may just complicate your job search. Well, today, we hope to alleviate those worries and those stresses to show you how you can get a better resume with my friend, Matt Warzel. Matt Warzel is the founder of MJW Careers, and as a CPRW, which means Certified Professional Resume Writer, career coach and outplacement expert with over 15 years in human resources and advancement techniques, Matt provides assistance to companies in transition from downsizes to buyouts, as well as individual job seekers needing to advance their careers. Matt has a long history of working in human resources and on recruitment staffing teams across a variety of industries. He fashions resumes that allow employers to review the applicant's assets while highlighting his or her accomplishments, showcasing impacts on employers' bottom lines using quantitative verbiage and maintaining brevity. Matt has over 705 LinkedIn recommendations and over 8,000 followers on LinkedIn and 100 Google recommendations. Wow. So as you can see, Matt is just going to be amazing. And this episode's really going to help you if you're struggling to get that solid resume. So let's launch right into it with our 165th episode of the Let's Eat Grandma Career Warrior Podcast. All right, Matt, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. How are you today? It is great to have you on the show and just I'm so impressed as a fellow resume writer with your credentials and your experience. So I know we're going to have a really awesome discussion about resumes. And just real quick, I know we're going to be convincing some people here about the specifics of resume writing, but let's be honest, writing our resumes can suck and be a total headache. Not a lot of people enjoy writing their resumes. So my question to you is, why should people work on the resume and what results should they expect with these improvements that we're going to talk about? Sure. You know, it's a one and done type thing. I mean, sometimes you'll have a variation of a resume if you maybe want to target sales roles only and then maybe marketing roles only. Okay, so now you're talking two different kinds, but usually you'll kind of keep the experience and education stuff all the same. You just kind of alter the top and I'll get into that later. But it's a one and done. I mean, you're talking about your livelihood and it's not something that, you know, it's not just like a, an application where you can kind of casually do it and kind of play half a game. This is dictating sometimes your resume is a marketing. It's usually a marketing tool, but sometimes it's a tool that will leverage more money during an interview. Right, right. I mean, there's so many benefits to having a solid resume. Sometimes it can be used for if somebody's trying to, you know, kind of get a sense of just kind of where you've been and what you're trying to do. And then sometimes they just want it for file. Right. So there's the ends of the spectrum where the recruiting process is so lengthy. They want to make sure that they got the ace in the hole right on the first time they hire someone. They don't want to have to come back after the person quits in a, sure. two months and redo all this because, they, you know, there's there's so many steps in the sourcing all the way through negotiations. So it's imperative that you play the game, keep up with the competition that are having professionally made resumes and done right. And then you don't have to worry. Then you can take it and start <laughs> submitting it and handing it to people at networking events. I love that. And I think people a lot of the times get frustrated, tripped up. And those are oftentimes the people I try to speak to during podcasts like this are people who feel frustrated with their job search, because I know it's really tough. Like I know sometimes for these positions, you'll send out your resume to these applications and all of a sudden you're competing against hundreds of other people. So one thing I really hope to do here is just to give people hope in their job search and know that, you know, patience sometimes is what it takes before you get noticed. And we'll of course go over some things that are going to get them to stand out above all the other you know, 100, 200 plus people that are applying for the same job. So Matt, let us talk about some essentials that job seekers should be including on the resumes or some things that people really need to be considering. We had a really good conversation about this, the concept of the anatomy of the resume before that. What's the first thing that comes to mind that job seekers should be focusing on when it comes to the resumes? I would say my the most important piece is your experience and it's the content in the experience. Even the recruiter that's in the group can probably vouch for this. But a lot of times as recruiters, as bad of a habit as it is, we are a creature of going to the titles and seeing what they've been doing. Yep. And because 
I'm a marketing major and I've never done product engineering, but I get what they do and I get kind of ebb and flow of it and what needs to go in a resume. But I'm not going to sit there and try to analyze 50 acronyms specific to this product engineer. So you got to play the game where you don't want too much and you don't want, you know, not enough. You got to find that nice blend. So that's going to be your experience section is going to be your calling card, so to speak. And from there, they'll kind of get a tale of where you've been and what you've been doing. Now, sometimes hiring managers will do the kind of the book reading version where they start with a summary and they kind of go down. Everybody's different. Every recruiter's different. Every hiring manager's different. And that's why the job hunting game sucks, like you said, because this recruiter might be cool this day and then they're, uh, you know, a jerk the next day because they just broke up with, with their significant other. So there's so many variables that play into the hiring game. And it sucks that people kind of hold that much power over your admission into Amazon or the Googles of the world. But they got there. They're the ones in charge. You got to play the game and make sure you're touching the right spots that appease those decision makers. In a second, I want to kind of go back to that because that's an important thing is like, what if, you know, my job title doesn't directly apply towards that position I'm applying for? What if I don't have that going for me? If what if I haven't worked for Google? But let's circle back into that in a second here. But I want to ask you here, what is a really big mistake that people are making when it comes to their experience section on the resume? Grammar and the half sentences. It's like drove the van on the loading docks, packed the pallets and prioritized, you know, and it's like, oh, God, like, no, like we know what a warehouse manager does or warehouse worker does. But what did you do? Did you pack the pallets, 50 of them in an hour to save yeah. X amount of time or how much bulk were you controlling every day? How much tonnage or whatever? So just think of like the aspects of setting the tone for the hiring manager and the recruiter. So when they're looking at you, they can visualize where you've been in exact spot and understand, oh, this person was with this company. I know their business. They are a real sharp company. And look, they were doing this type of role there. Oh, I can envision what they've been doing. This is going to be a perfect fit. Or they'll say, ah, that company's not that big. And this is an Amazon warehouse. So they might get a little overwhelmed. And so you got to kind of set it like almost right. like you're an author writing a screenplay or whatever. Is that a mistake you see people making? Are they being too generic with their descriptions? A lot of general. And, and you would think and based off the, you know, I know we're in the industry, but it's almost kind of gone from a should be task based to accomplishment space. But everyone knows that now. Right. Like it was right. It used to be like a mystery 10 years ago. Everyone's trying to get this idea. <laughs> and now it's like it should be kind of a known thing, almost like ATS. Now, everyone who's a job hunter kind of understands somewhat or they what the gist ATS. of it is. Yeah. yeah. They don't, might not know the technical stuff of it, but they get the idea that that stores resumes for recruiters. So later on, they can go and, and find you again or vet a candidate, depending on how technical their software gets. But so I'm finding that the generalisms and the common mistakes, those are the first and foremost pet peeves, just based off the pure fact of it's kind of lazy. <laughs> you don't want to come off <laughs> as kind of lazy. Right. Absolutely. I really would like to thank you for bringing that up because that actually is the number one mistake that I see when people send in their resumes. And Daniel, I know you've done career scores where we grade people's resumes for free. You can attest in how many people are simply not including enough information and numbers, things to quantify for the things you've done, I think are so incredibly important. But go ahead. I was going to say one other one that because I just got my list out and I was like, I actually wrote an article about this. And my number one thing was capitalizing everything. Don't capitalize everything because you think it sounds like it's an important word that doesn't people want to see that you can adhere to the English grammar language and follow the rules of a basic sentence structure and kind of, you know, make them know that you're detail oriented and actually are putting in time to develop this piece. Because as someone who's a resume writer, it might not affect recruiters as much because they're not really maybe resume writing as in depth as we are. But for us, it's such a time suck. Right. So just capitalize proper pronouns as you would in regular life. <laughs> yes. Great. Or too much bolding or yeah, underlining or yeah. italics or all that stuff. I, I mean, I love it, but too much is like putting a crap ton of salt in your dish and it just tastes, it's just too much. Yeah. So I love that. And just to answer about the meat of your experience section, what should I include there? Um, let's say I've had a ton of experience, but do I include everything? How do I get strategic about what to actually include? Right. So assume that the hire managers are smart people and know what you're doing, quote unquote, in your role, right? If you're an operations manager, they know you're handling operations, whether it's financial stuff, technical stuff, deliverables, whatever. They understand what an operations manager does. 
So don't worry about as much as like telling your story of yeah. here's what I do. It's more like here's what I've done as a bottom line impact and let them fill in the gaps with. So essentially, if you say, let's just go with operations manager and you say, you know, supervise X amount of people and ensured a 99 percent sustained on time delivery rate for five consecutive years. That sounds great. Now they know you supervise. Right. So we don't need to go and write you're a leader 15 other times. I mean, right. There's ways to get cute with the app contract system to kind of keyword optimize, but there's also ways to just be like, okay, we know you're a servant leader. Stop saying it. So like be really cautious with your choice of words and be very selective because every word counts. And if you keep saying training, you better be going for a training role. Otherwise, if you're an operations manager, tell me you're a trainer, a coach and a mentor and ins- inspirationer at 637, <laughs> seven o'clock. Uh, but you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, Preach it and then move on. Don't beat a dead horse. It's like when people try to like revisit conversations because they want to f- fill the air after they make their one point. Don't. So for the experience section, be selective. Every bit of this advice we give you, take it with a grain of salt because everybody is uh, different, right? Everyone's customized a little bit differently. So keep that in mind. This, this is necessarily a catch off everybody, but it's kind of a general rule. So be selective of your sentences. Make them Bottom line, again, accomplishments based and moreover, value driven, right? So value, yep. you're either costing the employer money or you're making them money. Show them that you're making the money and you're concerned about the bottom line. And I think hire managers like that because now they know there's no fuss in this person. They get it. What we're trying to do here is move things ahead, make money for everybody and continue growth. So have that in mind when you're going in with these people that, hey, I'm not here to just you take care of me now. You're my boss. So you take care of me now. Be proactive, get in there and start changing some stuff up and you'll be a better employer than you were coming in to the job to begin with. Absolutely. And I just want to go back to it. Everyone should have this written down somewhere, but just value driven. Value driven is so important because if you are the type of person that shows how you helped your company move forward in whatever way, you're going to be the type of person that stands out in their resume. Another thing that I know people struggle with is the summary or summary of qualifications, like people call it. First of all, is this the objective statement or are we talking about the objective or is this something different, Matt? It borderlines on the objective. Here's the interesting. So I still see resumes today, though, that still have the word objective. Objective, right. (laughs) Right. And, And then it just says to gain a spot as a CDL driver. But and I learned this from a mentor maybe seven, eight years ago before she passed away. But she gave me some of the most logical thinking behind writing resumes. And I've kind of stuck to that notion yeah. and just altered it a little bit as I've gone on. But it just always sticks tried and true is I'd like to have a third sentence in the summary. So I have three sentences. One is a kind of an overview who you are. Two is what you can achieve. And three is how you can achieve it. And what I like to do is kind of at the very end, just say something brief like, you know, results focused team builder seeking a leverage background into a medical sales or clinical sales role for progressive organization. And I use it for every resume, that same line, except for <laughs> yeah. whatever their kind of, uh, you know, team builder, team player, complex solver, customer relations, whatever that kind of like another kind of like fun title that's not necessarily a proper title. And then what their targeted role is. And then sometimes I'll even focus the final sentence on something specific. So if they say, Hey, I want to be a learning and development person, but only at K through 12 thing, uh, whatever. So I'll say for a progressive institution, comma, focusing on K through 12. So you're getting very niche. And I like that because first off, I don't think it turns anyone off because you're not just saying a statement about what you want to do. You're kind of leading into it with all these kind of, you know, a couple sentences of some really neat stuff that's essentially setting the tone for these hiring managers saying you're looking for someone in, in product engineering that's all me, you know, and you're showing them all this stuff right away of like, this person's got some words that rely, that directly relate to this. And this summary is really kind of impressive. That's already set the tone. Now you're like, let's just keep telling a story then. Just keep the layers going. Yeah. I mean, I'll just tell you like the reason why I think summaries are so important is because it takes up the most prime real estate on your resume. Yeah. Right. It's that top section. It's the thing that we're oftentimes, I mean, you've recruited for way longer than I ever have. But you know just how much people pay attention towards that top half of the resume, right? Right. So the thing I'll say with that is that I thought was just genius is that last sentence you're talking about with those skills are a really good way to include those keywords for the resume, which was a question we talked about earlier. So I think that we're already starting to answer the question is like, how can I get my resume actually noticed with the application tracking system? So I think that's amazing. And and do you tweak every summary or how do you do that? 
So essentially, this is a kind of a trick too. So say like you want to do sales and you want to do marketing, not necessarily both, right? You're going to go for one or the other. So you have two different resumes, sales and then marketing. You want to tweak your summary, which is your, like you said, your, that's your intro. And that's going to set the tone. Underneath that, I have core competencies. I like them there. A lot of people will put them all over the place. You can put them in a body. And a lot. I like them there because they're going from a summary of telling a person who you are, what you offer to words that, oh my God, these are all words I see every day in my world. Oh, uh, Six Sigma. Oh, Lean. Oh, 5S. Oh, Kaizen. Oh, Supply Chain. Oh, Project Man. So now they're seeing stuff like, cool, this person has buzzwords that they're going to be doing stuff with all day at this place. And, and then I like to have an accomplishment section, okay, right before the experience. I like this accomplishment section. So then you take your five to seven banging best yeah. stuff that relate to that role and put yeah. them right there. And now your top half of your first page is all that particular role. Then the experience can all flush out the same because it's like, you're not, I'm not going to beat a dead horse. I'm not going to like change too much stuff and experience if I don't have to, because we've already quantified it. It's already uh, value driven. It's just maybe you can alter some of the tasks and stuff within the experience. So that is kind of a, you know, a case by case scenario of how much you're going to alter beyond those accomplishments. Yeah. Matt, I love that. I think you're giving people really awesome formula to get noticed right off the bat when it comes to their resumes. And a funny question that popped up in the chat, and it's it's something that I was thinking as well is talking about numbers and including them to quantify things. Someone says, couldn't we just be making up numbers that <laughs> add value yeah. to sound impressive on the resume? So like, what do numbers really mean? And like, what if it's hard for me to find out these numbers? No, that's great. First off, don't lie ever. Um, <laughs> but second off, for them to validate those numbers, it's a toss up because sometimes they, can't. they email your employer or something. I don't know. <laughs> well, or just look up <laughs> sales numbers online and try to figure it out. But here's the thing. Most people won't take that much into it, but you don't want to go in there saying I can manage a $10 million budget. And then they give you $5 million budget and you're like a fish in, on land. So like, don't make anything up. But this is a great question. You don't necessarily have to have the number. If you can get some numbers, perfect. We can weave them into a nice sentence where there is a pop to it because employers like to see numbers, right? It just stands out. If you, it does. If you don't have them, I call them business quantifiers. And this is kind of how I write all my resumes. So if you're like a administrative assistant and you're like, I don't have any numbers, you know, the most things I track is probably office expenses and it's probably two grand a month in office expenses or whatever their numbers maybe are, aren't as heavy as a salesperson, right? So what they can do is quantify them without using a number. So instead of saying, you know, took care of customer correspondence and followed up with all the clients, you could say something like drove client retention which is a quantifier. Okay, you're talking about retention metrics now. You drove retention by cultivating relations and troubleshooting discrepancies through, you know, timely resolution or whatever. I'm just kind of shooting from the hip. But your quantifier there is is drove retention. Another quantifier, improve sales. They don't maybe they don't, you can't even say the sales number because you're in a sales role that is private. They're confidential numbers. So you could just say drove sales or drove thousands of dollars in annual sales or millions of dollars in annual sales or Cut costs, reduce waste, streamline efficiency, you know, slash time or manpower or eliminated workflow bottlenecks. And so think in terms of whatever you're doing, what's it best relate to? Time, money, improvements, whatever. Just think of like, what's the kind of notion that yes. would, and then try to fill that in so it goes from a regular task to a solid starts off with yes. a great little metric, but not using a number itself. Yes. Numbers jump out on paper. Numbers pop out on your resume. Everyone should be writing this as a note because it is a trade secret of resume writers. Yeah. Is it's just There's just something psychological about reading something that makes you stop wherever you are. Even if you're reading a resume in three to six seconds, numbers pop out and you're going to pay attention to whatever bullet point that is. So I think that's just awesome. And, and, and one last thing on that is don't overdo it either. For my sales clients out there, God love you. I'm sales. in the same role. <laughs> um, you, it's like, do not give me those little plus negative signs over things and a 0.2%. And, and, you know, this, if they want to know more sales numbers, the hiring managers will, will inquire about those. The recruiter just needs to see okay. a few numbers. So it looks like you care about bottom line. And it actually shows what type of environment you're in year over year budget numbers, volume of people or clients and accounts, whatever, simple eye level stuff. You don't need to go 
my merchandising people, I love you, but I don't need that many numbers on a resume yeah. either. <laughs> it's just like capitalization and bolding. You don't want to overdo it. Yeah. So awesome. Matt, I'm going to put myself in the perspective of some job seekers here, some that I have spoken to over the years. Let's say I'm having a lot of trouble getting noticed by submitting my resume online. It's like, what the heck? I've applied to like, it seems like 100 jobs and I'm getting all these auto rejections back. What are some things that I should be doing to make sure that I include keywords on my resume? Where else should I really be looking to get noticed by these robots? Sure. So your first bet is the job description, because as recruiter, we say, Mrs. Manager, what's your open role? It's a technical writer. Here's what I need. Thank you very much. I look at this job description as a recruiter and I go, here's the software they need. Here's all the stuff they're going to be doing. And then I'm going to go on there and go, what words can I use from this job description to find people like this? And that's the Mm. crucial thing is it's not a hidden thing. It's out there. And so job description online is going to have everything the hiring manager wants. So try to alter some of the stuff. If you really want that job, try to alter some of your content to match that particular role that you're targeting. This can become tedious. It can even get you know, overwhelming because you're like, how many resumes do I need? I always say, try to have that kind of, you know, if you're a technical writer, have this technical writer resume and then just sprinkle in a few customizations for some of these roles that you really, really want. And not to say that all roles aren't worthy, but how much effort do you want to make and how much time consume consummation do you want to take on to get that role? Complain all day about whatever's against us. And I'm not, you know, that's a lot of, competitions, they're doing it. They're working 12 hours trying to find a job by altering their resumes and networking through LinkedIn and and using social media companies to follow and become a brand ambassador and actually get known through back channels. I mean, there's so many things you could be doing to find a job. And it sounds like a lot of work. But again, this is our livelihood. So we should be taking this a little more serious than and not that you people aren't. But I'm saying like in general, just people think like, you know, I applied a few jobs, time to, you know, kick back and watch the, you know, new news. And it's like, come on, guys, we got to keep it going. You got to keep putting your efforts out there and making it known. So job description, number one. Number two, I always like is LinkedIn endorsement section. If you go down LinkedIn profile, anybody's LinkedIn profile, go to the bottom. They got that little key skills area where people can plus you and you get, you know, X amount of those are great because LinkedIn's trying to standardize some of that stuff a little bit. And as much as it's you know probably not going to work because everybody loves having their own titles at companies, um, it's still a good starting spot. Because if you find somebody at a company you want to work for in a department you want to work for with a title that you want to be, go on their LinkedIn, find out what the stuff they got on their LinkedIn profile. I mean, that's their resume right there. That's their digital presence. Go and see what they're doing. What do they have on their resume? What are the under endorsement section keywords? And if you don't know any, go get continue education. If it's saying you got to know Salesforce and you don't know that CRM, Go and there's so much free education right now because of COVID that you could take advantage of like getting a Harvard online for free. I mean, there's so many like crazy things right now that you can access for free for resource wise that, you know, maybe do that and get that skill acquired and then you can put it on your resume. Awesome. Yeah, I think people need to look on the bright side, especially when it comes to these types of things, just because I hate to be that guy that says, like, always stay positive. You can always find, you know brightness in the darkness but it's absolutely true how many things that are available for us and like sometimes it just takes a little bit of motivation to get ourselves there to take that online course but matt i'm really glad you brought that up absolutely i like to have what i call lightning round where i ask my podcast guests some questions really quick questions and you have to answer in less than one minute (laughs) so a few questions here number one what is your favorite client success story it's not resume related, unfortunately. It's recruiting related. That's okay. okay. I had to find a candidate for Ford in Cleveland, Ohio, because Ford got a bunch of hand me down controls pieces, controls equipment. Controls equipment are those robots in the factories that pick stuff up. And this person, so Ford had all these old controls from like 1970. And so no one knows these, how to program these things. Not only that, they had to have someone who had design work and quality assurance work in their background. So they wanted to find this gem, found a person that was about 100 miles away, got them to relocate for the role. But the interview story, he shows up to the interview and he was wearing leather pants with an open shirt. And he had one of those Italian horn necklaces. <laughs> and he had this like curly, like, you know, uh, greaser hair, like, but like, cur- like almost like Travolta in like a 70s movie. And I was like, oh, man, I'm, I'm done for now. And my manager even called. He's like, didn't you tell Conrad what to wear to the interview? He came with leather pants on. I was like, 
I'm like, I know. I'm like, did he get the job? And he's like, he got it. <laughs> I was like, yeah, that's why. Because no one in the world knows this, what to do with these machines but this guy. So it was like this guy I developed a rapport with. I went to lunch with him a bunch of time. Great guy. He was so smart and so well-versed that he could have wore leather pants and a shoehorn and it wouldn't matter. Wow. Substance. I was like, how is this going to be a success story? And then it turned it around. All right. Number two, what is the number one mistake people make when it comes to their resume? I said it earlier, but not enough or too much. You got to find that that medium. Redundancies will kill you. You know, so don't beat the dead horse, like I said. But also, if you don't, if you're lacking, if you got the half sentences, maybe you only got like two things per experience or whatever. Just find that nice line in the middle and, and stick to it. And moreover, make it pragmatic, make it logical. If you crinkle the foreheads of the hiring managers when they're reading your resume, you've lost the battle, right? So don't let them crinkle their foreheads. Let them read it and go, oh, and then, and let them eye open. <laughs> Opposite of crinkle. Awesome. And what is the worst resume you've ever received and why? And this was what I said earlier about the sloppily done ones. And it almost drives me crazy still to this day because I get it. Some people might not even have an email still or be a savvy on the computer or, or written form. Then find someone who is because you have one chance to stand out. Everyone knows it. They've heard that adage. It makes sense, though. Recruiters do use app contracting systems to monitor you as a candidate every time you apply or reach out. So it's important to set the tone correctly and make it where they know you've invested to get to that point, even just getting an interview like your competition is. My fourth question is, that is, how long should my mm -hmm. resume be? Uh, First off, you're going to hate the answer because everyone's different. But outside of the CV people, the federals, the academia, where you got to list publications, all that stuff outside of those normal, you know, up into the executive level, executives can sometimes fluctuate, too. But let's just say entry level is usually about a one page. I wouldn't go over one page because most of it's going to be fluff. Then um, I witnessed that firsthand. you got to really have a lot of internships and stuff to, to get to a second page. But then. Once you get a few years under your belt, it's fine to go into two. People scroll. I don't go to hiring managers with paper resumes. You know what I mean? As a recruiter, you send it on an email. So I wouldn't get hung up as far as one or two. But if it is two pages, it better be relevant. It better not just be repetitive stuff mm. or just showing you work from your old college days when you've been out of school for 10 years. But, you know, you want to leave it on there because you really enjoyed it. It's like, <laughs> you know, be selective with what you keep on. And the more you have on, just make sure it's relevant, because if you could sum yeah. it up quicker, good, because these people are busy and they want to move on to the next candidate. One of our meetups we had before COVID hit was it was a debate on how long the resume should be. And because I know there's a lot of different opinions on there and we had some wine and it was super fun. But I like your answer, Matt. I would stand by that. And I've never unless very rarely written resumes that gone beyond two pages. So yeah, good point. All right. Last question is, this is more of an open-ended fill in the blank here, Matt. So cover letters should be blank. Pain point centric. Find out why they have that opening. And if you don't know why they have the opening, assume or try to gear your terminology towards a catch-all of, hey, I know you have pain points based off the research I've done. And here's how I'm going to come in and resolve and fill that void of those pain points. There's a reason there's an opening. It's just the same old kind of idea of, when you're interview training, use those types of stories and narratives that relate to that job and why that, that job is open. So I know it's sometimes impossible. I get it. But if you can use any research news, Google News, LinkedIn posts, Glassdoor, you know, find out if you can why you think they might have that opening. Even if you have a shot in the dark and you think maybe they might appreciate you just kind of showing how much knowledge and research you've done for that role. So I think it's more of a pain point centric mentality versus a, you know, here's my summary on a half sheet though. What problem is the company trying to solve and just yeah. really drive it home? Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but Matt, I just want to say thanks so much for joining us on the show. Your answers were spot on and Thank I you. don't always agree with everything that every other resume writer does, but I think you and I are in sync with a lot of things when it comes to resume writing. So Fantastic. just want to say thanks. I thought you were spectacular. Hey, thank you very much for having me. It was fun. Perfect. And last question for you is how can people find out more about you and how to connect? Absolutely. So my go to jobstickers.com. It's like pot stickers, but job stickers. And that's my blog and it's directly on my website. So from there, you can see all my services and all that stuff. Cool. Thanks so much, Matt. For the sake of this podcast, we're going to drop some links just because I know there were a lot of questions that were unanswered. 
So within the description, I'll make sure to link some other episodes. We have some questions about ageism, some questions about other resume formats. So I'll make sure to link those as well. But just want to say that this wraps up today's episode. Make sure to go and look really closely at those job postings you're applying for and make sure to be value driven. That was one of my favorite points that was made during this podcast by Matt. And just can't emphasize enough that people need to make sure that the resumes are targeted and showcase as much value for the jobs that they're applying for. So that wraps up episode 165. Thanks so much for tuning in and I'll see you next time.